Masada, a novel of love, courage, and the triumph of the human spirit by Ernest K. Gaughan, previously published as The Antagonists. The Antagonist by Ernest Kellogg Gaughan. Previously published as The Antagonists, a Jove book. This is for my dear Polly. Copyright 1970 by Ernest K. Gaughan. Published by arrangement with author's agent. Author's note. In these days of patriotic cynicism, some readers may be inclined to disbelieve the behavior of the zealots of Masada. I direct the doubts of such unfortunates to more contemporary martyrs, say those of Hungary, who defied Russian tanks with rocks, and those like the Czech Jean Palak, who chose to welcome the Russian invaders by self-immolation. Also present at the barricades have been the many wildly courageous North and South Vietnamese, Cubans, Africans, Russians, Frenchmen, Germans, Chinese, Greeks, Bulgars, and Japanese, who in one fashion or another decided life was not worth living without what they personally conceived as freedom. These are the true now people, and there will unquestionably be more of them tomorrow. In the loosely employed name of freedom, man remains the only creature on earth to make war on his own species. Anyone who has convinced himself patriotism is dead has learned nothing from the ancient history and does not know contemporary history. I have been meticulously careful to ensure authenticity throughout this book. Many facts were available, although nowhere near the qua quantity found in the usual research of a historical event. So, if I have erred, it is not for want of trying. The works of, the works of Josephus were, of course, of inestimable value, but unfortunately, he was not personally present to report the siege of Masada. The magnificent works and archaeological research, plus the vicarious inspiration of Yigal Yadin, affected this writing more than any other single force. From his discoveries, I have contrived a story. Both Elazar ben Yair and General Flavius Silva existed and were the actual antagonists at Masada. However, Elazar ben Yair's career was terminated as described on Masada, and, and Silva seems to have simultaneously disappeared from history. Friday Harbor, San Juan Island, Ernest K. Gone. One, during the fourth year of Vespasian. It is like this, said the centurion Rosianus Geminus. Your putrefying helmet is your home, and it will be until you are too crippled to fight, or you are killed, or you have pensioned off. This putrefying desert is no paradise, but is not so bad when you remember what it is like in the northern lands this time of year. He scratched at his black spade beard and heaved a ponderous sigh to indicate how thoroughly he understood his listener's misery. 
We are all together in this putrefying shithouse, and I don't pretend to know how long it will last. But there's no sense mooning about where you came from or why. You're here! I'm just as tired as you are of looking at that putrefying rock and watching it dance when the sun gets high. One thing only will I promise you. The putrefying situation won't last. Our putrefying general may have his snoot in the jug more than is good for him, but he'll bring the Jews down from this rock if he has to give up the grape to do it. I have known Flavius Silva a long time soldier. Having spoken, Geminus, the many scarred veteran who knew all things, moved his bulk off through the starlight. When the stars began to dissolve in the ashen light, the sentry murmured his gratitude. It was nearly the end of his patrol, and no matter where you stood, a post, an empty belly, sounded the same. Condescending remarks from putrefying officers about how things could be much worse did not fill your grain bin any more than they soothe this maddening eruption of heat rash wherever metal, leather, and flesh met, or the most powerful irritation which was not in the belly but in the groin. The old timers jeered and spat and mined copulation with an imaginary female if you mention the yearning. But some of the better natured said they were old men of 18 before they realized they had married the Legion. He looked up at the black mass that obliterated most of the eastern sky. It was there forever and ever, like the people on it and the stars. Here was another morning staring up at the hated rock of Masada, which was more a mountain than a rock. You were supposed to watch the chasm between you and the rock, as if the Jews could pass unseen beneath the stars. The officers knew it was impossible, and the putrefying general should know it was impossible. The sentry pushed back his helmet until the rim tormented the postules and volcanoes on the back of his neck. He sighed. All of this was so far from home. He turned to look west toward the center of the camp and his own tent, which was at least more of a home than a helmet. It stood not far from the much larger tent which was the general's and which probably was like a home. No common soldier entered there except Praetorian guards and they were so anxious to keep cushions under their putrefying asses they would never speak of the wonders within that tent. So every man had his own idea and some said it was full of booty, all shining, and some said the whole world east of Brundisium was ruled right in there, and others said the general was drunk all the time, especially at night. One, two. He was called Shem, the son of Ishmael, that same Ishmael who, along with 30 other captives, had been used as a human torch during the celebrations after Jerusalem. Shem's father had been set afire because Titus wished to celebrate the birthday of his brother Domitian, or so he declared. Those close to Titus recognized the burning as a matter of dual purpose. Not only would it add spice to the routine slaughter of some 2,000 other Jews, it would also serve notice on all who might witness the show even by hearsay that the war was over and the Romans would not tolerate the slightest opposition. 
Although many of Titus's staff considered the burning distasteful and urged that all those selected be allowed to kill each other to prove they were mortals against the wild beast assembled for the purpose, the majority were more unhappy about the sight. Instead of a proper amphitheater to accommodate their number, the shadeless, fly-infested valley Titus had chosen for the occasion offered little comfort. And those who crimped their rumps sitting on stones said the choice was probably a true reflection of Titus's secret contempt for his brother. Shem, the son of Ishmael, drawn irresistibly to the vicinity along with more than a hundred other boys, crept to the edge of the thicket which, which rimmed the valley and from the distance watched his father expire. At fourteen he had reached the mare stage in life and he knew that he would spend the rest of it killing Romans. Now having survived for 17 years, and therefore having ripened into a bakor, he was entrusted with one of the 38 towers along the ramparts. Thus far, he had struck down 11 careless Romans with only 15 bolts. There were times, as on this morning, when Shem thought of himself as a bird, for his perch was so lofty and commanded such a view that he experienced before the dawn light revealed the horizon a soaring sensation. It was as if he had been lifted among the stars and there supplied with a pair of wings to drift as he pleased over his friends and enemies. Just below his tower slept the people of Masada, then, in the void, all around lay the soft-lit desert. He had but to glance downward to see Romans. The lights in their camps twinkled like the stars above, and they appeared to be in the same number. And along the west side, where the Romans drove their captives night and day to labor on the great ramp, the torches of the overseers moved about unceasingly. The Romans had learned their lesson. Even at night they now kept their distance and if work had to be done close beneath the walls of Masada, they sent their captive Jews. Or, Shem suspected, they disguised themselves as such. The possibility troubled him greatly and he had spent many nights trying to think of a way to identify the targets he so desired. It had been much too long, nearly a month since Shem, son of Ishmael, had killed a Roman. 1-3 General Flavius Silva lay flat on his back watching a thin crescent of light appear above the middle of his tent and slowly gather intensity. Its very presence caused him to reflect unhappily upon the thickness of his head and alternately upon his house in Praneste. By all the gods, it was the same frustration everywhere whether you tried to accomplish something in that lovely rose-scented region so convenient to Rome or here in the wilderness of Judea. A new house or a siege. To have things properly done required more than an order. You must see after whatever it was yourself, letters from architects notwithstanding. For a moment, he reviewed the latest post from a correspondent he had decided was not only a scoundrel but inept as well. Antoninus Mamilianus, who presumed to call himself an architect. 
To Flavius Silva, General of the Legions, Procurator of Judea from Antoninus Mamilianus, greeting. I am confident you would approve all the latest work done during the past month, though the cost has exceeded the original estimate by a considerable sum. Most of the excess is due to changes in plans made by your esteemed self. In, in particular, the addition of a bathing pool and six statues which will grace the peristylium. The columns are of Etruscan marble and the heads of obsidian, which I was fortunate to obtain. I tried very hard to persuade the great Sextus Carilaeus to do the sculpting, but he is so much in demand these days he could not promise delivery in less than three years. Consequently, I have split the work between Drusus Balbus, whose reputation may be known to you, and Calpurnius Phobatris, a Greek freedman from Syracuse, who has recently produced some interesting basalts. Both of these men are expensive to say the least, the former demanding 60,000 sesterces and the later 40,000 with an additional bonus of 10,000 if he delivers before the close of this year. You may obtain some satisfaction in the knowledge that when the flower boxes are in place and the grape arbor and shade trees are all flourishing, then the whole must certainly fulfill your original desires. When all is done, the villa should be a place of great tranquility. Silva tried to remember what Vitruvius had written in his training of the architect. Something about practice and theory, something like those who rely on only theory were hunting shadow, not substance. Mamilianus would do well to reread his Vitruvius. There has been a great deal of unrest among the building trades recently. First, the plasterers refused to whitewash their own work, which required calling in a second group whose monetary demands were such that I myself was stunned. However, there was no individual workman who could even come near the villa until the matter was settled. So I could only surrender to the exhortations and take comfort in the assurance that my principal value to you as a creative watchdog is to keep harmony among the laborers and thus we may progress steadily. Then just last week, the plumbers refused to install the ornamental bronze stopcocks without payment for the extra labor involved fitting to the present lead ducts, etc. The crescent of light now above was caused by some Claude who had set the tent ropes too taut, therefore causing a breach between the cloth itself and the supporting pole and therefore betraying Rosianus Geminus who was not only captain of the Praetorian Guard but was also responsible for details concerning his general's comfort. Ergo, Geminus would soon hear harsh words from his supreme commander on the subject of military perfection in the 10th Legion, and he in turn would pass his embarrassment on to the Claude who had caused the Crescent. Via the end of his most eloquent whip, no doubt, and the Claude would protest that it never rains in Judea, and so what was all the fuss about a little gap in the general's tent. And he would be right, and he would still suffer the lash. Because the Roman army was too small for the world, it must rule. 
It existed on discipline, not only for the people it conquered, but for itself. The bleeding flesh of the clod would remind the entire camp that so small an oversight as a tent rope set incorrectly found punishment. Silver decided it was his own head that must be of obsidian, and during the night someone had certainly sprinkled his eyes with cinders. He half rose on the couch to look down upon the woman beside him. She appeared to be sleeping. Doubtless, he thought, she is faking, as she has done with varied success during the more aroused moments of yet another night, over-soaked in wine and now lost forever. She had squirmed at the appropriate times, grunted and moaned as if by military drill numbers, but there had been no inner heat to her flesh or emission of her life juice during their writings. She had submitted once more with sullen willingness, complying with every physical instruction, and had thus once more made a mockery of their union. He regretted the night, it was as if he had again lost a skirmish he should not have lost. A woman armed only with a skin of polished amber, he thought, has caused me to taste the bitterness of retreat and is so careless of her victory she dares make me wait upon her awakening. As if I were some poor courtier standing attendance upon a queen. Watching her, Amused at his patience with her, he wondered how he could make absolute conquest of this female who was like an old and acid woman masquerading in a youthful body, a sorceress who had managed to cast her first spell from a distance and then close it upon him like a net. It was a unique relation, he thought, the result of some barbaric necromancy he could not recognize. Preposterous! Why should he trouble himself with this one female when he had only to clap his hands for a multitude? Yet a multitude of what? What relief was to be found in wrestling with the filthy local cows? whose diseased camp followers of skin grizzle hair and bone left over from the long campaign. They were hardly solace for the lowest legionary. During all this time in Judea, which had now been over three years, he had not before seen one woman he had considered worthy to receive his sperm. Have I been so long from Rome, he thought, that this girl woman now beside me seems a prize? How, if I am so stubborn and foolish as to keep her near me until she becomes habit, will she appear on the Capitoline Hill? How will she behave in the theater of Marcellus, the shops about the Forum? or say, strolling beneath Pompey's portico. If I take this country bumpkin to the games, will I introduce her to my friends to be laughed at? Will the dear, sweet, absolutely merciless ladies of Rome perceive her history at a glance? Regard the blind general, they might say, he who lost both his vision and his mind in Palestine, and so brought home a trophy he thought was a baboon. Another Jewess. Have you heard that on the site of her every last one of her household gods jumped into the Tiber? Do you suppose that she will one day insist poor addled Flavius Silva have himself circumcised? Ouch! What a spectacle, he mused. Apparently, I am just another stallion 
thrusting myself at something I have told myself is or should be in heat. And the owner of the something looks so very tempting because she has no real competition. Am I so taken with her simply because she speaks Greek as if it were her native tongue? Hebrew so that it does not sound like a throat irritation? And Aramaic so, so that even I can comprehend it? Does she drop her final consonants in the latest Bulgarian fashion? No, indeed. Not once have I caught her softening her W's or otherwise chewing on our national tongue. Then why? Do I snort and paw the ground in her presence simply because she is fearless or is such a clever mime she convinces me she is not afraid? How hungry must I be and lonely to find myself preening for her arrival and then posing with chin in hand like some eager youth while I listen to her as if she had some immortal message to convey. And of all the manifestations doubled and redoubled in absurdity, I must play the game of seduction, actually cooperate in petty flirtation what while we survey each other and she so coldly measures the force of my desire. When the heat and pressure is sufficient, then we must toy with each other, experimenting and very cautiously exploring as if she were the most innocent virgin. And then at last, when my eyes are dazed and I have been reduced to a whinnying stud, then at last, Depending upon the time of day, the weather, the consumption of wine with our meal of assignation, coupled with the soothsayer confided in her yesterday, then after an overture of laughter or tears, and testing the velocity and direction of the wind, whether it be north or south or east or west, matched against the existence of any possible noise, musical or otherwise. Then and only then can we embark on one variety of fornication, unless at the very last moment she changes her mind, for which activity he reminded himself there is nothing worse than an indifferent partner. Now he was certain that she was feigning sleep, and he saw that she had even contrived to fix an appearance of contentment about her rather heavily featured face. She is too large of mouth, he told himself, as he had so many times before. On the other female, her mouth might be considered outrageous, yet her lips formed such a seductive frame they caught all attention. Her cheekbones and nose and brow were also molded with definite force, and still each was in such harmony with its neighboring feature the whole visage became a subtle masterpiece. Was it not, blind man? After all, a true masterpiece dared not to be perfect in all its parts. He suddenly remembered the first time he had noticed her eyes staring at him defiantly from an ocean of other eyes, mostly beseeching. That day, less than a month ago, he had left hit this interminable business in the wilderness and traveled with all speed to Jericho, where the garrison was reported to have mutinied. The report proved to be an exaggeration, although the troops were certainly out of control, and no wonder since they were all auxiliaries, a mixed bag of Syrians, Numidians, Greeks, and Arabians, without a true Roman among them. The chief fault lay with their weak spine commander, who called himself by the normally honored Roman name of Quadratus, although by birth the man was an Egyptian. 
The poor wretch had been so terrified of his troops, he had allowed them to rampage as they willed simply because their pay had been delayed. Among other activities, they thought to solve their greed by rounding up all able-bodied inhabitants of Jericho and sending them off as slaves. Just who would buy during these days when the markets from Rome and Byzantium were glutted, they had not bothered to consider. It pleased Silva to recall that it had taken only himself ten of his Praetorians and forty mounted legionaries to bring that rabble to their senses. He had plunged into the turmoil, driving his finest chariot, the one presented to him after the fall of Jerusalem by Titus himself, a glorious vehicle with bronze heads of Medusa decorating the wheels and a golden satyr as the finial on the end of the draw pole. Surrounded by his Praetorians, wearing his finest cuirass with the breastplate embosed with the four seasons, a bull, an eagle, and two standards against a sky background, he had driven through the rebellious troops as if they were beneath contempt. He had commanded them to release the Jews at once, and their answer had been shouts of derision. Then he had raised his right hand, signifying his Roman word was Roman bound, and assured them their pay was newly minted, and en route from Rome, which was the truth, or he would not have given his right hand. It pleased him now to think that in his thirty-seven years he had not once pledged his word to deceive. His predecessor, Lucilius Bassus, had been expert at the double tongue, and but there was a different sort of procurator of Judea now. A true Corneli on his mother's side, hers being the last womb in the empire to produce bearers of that famous and most honored name. After some grumbling, all but a handful of the auxiliaries released their captives, but one group of a hundred or so hesitated too long. As their protest continued, Silva had simply opened his left fist in their direction and instantly his escort charged into their midst. Nine of the hesitants were run through and left to die in the street before the lesson in military protocol was thoroughly understood. When order had been restored, Silva had patiently explained to the survivors that looting, raping, and killing were to be done by order, Roman order or not at all, and he had advised them to pass on his proclamation to their comrades. All Jews were now part of the empire's wealth, and as a consequence not available for casual distribution among those who depended for their very life upon that supreme authority. When he had first arrived in Jericho, several hundred of the more resourceful Jews had sought protection from the marauding auxiliaries in uh, Quadratus' own courtyard. It was a pathetic refuge, uh, had they really known the man, uh, but at least they were spared the perils and indignities occurring in the streets. It was then that he had first found her eyes among so many others. Silva remembered how Quadratus had managed to host a reasonably decent meal on the upper terrace of his quarters, albeit the man was so distressed about his own safety he could hardly drink his wine. The quail had been tough and the olives mediocre, but there had been an excellent mullet fresh from the Sea of Galilee, 
and for a cracked lipped dried out desert soldier that fish had been enough to make a feast of the occasion afterward they had stepped to the parapet surrounding the terrace and looked down upon the Jews they had been confined in the courtyard for three days and of course were milling and fighting among themselves as Jews always did when their hands were idle it was astonishing how much mischief these people could get themselves into if they were not gamefully employed it seemed to be one of their eternal curses not to know what was good for them quite by accident Silva had noticed one group of Jews who remained a little apart from the others they were quiet and only the female among them looked up after a moment he had realized that she was challenging him he found himself wishing she would forsake her boldness and look away but but instead she seemed to defy him in a way no other Jew had ever dared finally it was he Flavius Silva master of Judea who had broken off the staring do you know that girl he had asked Quadratus yes she is of a family from Alexandria I understand they were rather prosperous shippers mostly green to Rome is that the father beside her yes he seems reasonably intelligent for a Jew actually the entire family affects uh, an educated manner which I find rather amusing what are they doing in Palestine they claim they had merely planned a pilgrimage to Jerusalem and their temple and to visit uh, relatives but of course Jews are incapable of purely exalted intentions or even simple affairs one must always seek for their hidden motives they also came to arrange for the export of wheat oil and balsam because they are or were members of an association we in Egypt called the Naviculari. Who is the other man? He is the brother to the father and a native of Jericho. It was he who urged his relatives to come three years ago. Rather bad timing, wouldn't you say, General? That pompous ass, Quadratus, had then laughed so uproariously all eyes both far away and near had turned upon him Silva could hear his laughter becoming thin and then ceasing altogether when he had decided he had endured more than enough Egyptian snobbery why did that decayed race persist in behaving as if they were all descendants of Cleopatra you laugh too easily quadratus which is perhaps the reason your troops are so unruly I will solve your present troubles but if they get out of hand again I warn you that it will be your own head on a pike the girl could not possibly have heard the reprimand yet she seemed pleased when quadratus had nearly gone down on his knees I am deeply grateful sir you may be you may be sure I shall find some way to enrich your life in return for mine how such a craven goat would enrich anyone's life remained a mystery until more than a week had passed and once more the desert seemed all of life and all there had ever been of life then a small caravan was reported approaching Masada from the oasis of En Gedi in the north with typical Egyptian deviousness and admittedly some imagination Kudratus had attempted to repay his debt he had sent the eyes to the wilderness accompanied by their father her uncle and his wife three alleged cousins as many servants and an armed escort to assure their safe delivery and with unmitigated impudence he had revealed his modus operandi 
having also sent a message of such flowering phrase and obvious scent. The long dead Cleopatra must have wept in her tomb. Worse, an Egyptian had presumed the Roman form in his communication. To Flavius Silva, procurator of Judea, general commanding the 10th legion from Ptolemaeus Quadratus, military governor, pro tem of Jericho. Greeting. All those acquainted with your location inform me it is one of the most desolate and uncomfortable places on earth. Thus do I even more admire your noble perseverance and utter dedication to the task at hand. In such a place I can only assume that even a Roman of your well-deserved power and resourcefulness cannot but lack for certain fundamental amenities of life, and for that want be troubled, which, which as I think of you robs me of what little sleep this minor command permits. The vision of Quadratus losing sleep over his commander-in-chief's discomfort was touching, but as nothing compared to his subsequent gesture, as he reviewed the heart of the message, Silva found himself smiling. Forgive me, distinguished general, if I presume to send you a present which may at first be difficult to open and may even try your patience. With your very great charm, I have a notion this gift may soon become more reasonable and afford you some hours of amusement and soothing relief from your arduous duties. Though my gift comes to you amply supplied with tents and all manner of goods, I apologize for the size, the truth being that the most important part resolutely refuse to leave without the others. I would not, of course, be surprised or in the slightest offended if you disposed of the excess of your pleasure. Inspiration for this gift came to me as I watched your face during the recent troubles here and particularly when you stood on my parapet observing the courtyard. It is said that we Egyptians are possessed of a special sense which permits us to detect human affinities even at a distance. I shall make a sacrifice to Venus in the hope that in this case my senses were functioning at their peak and that my selection pleases you. May the great Vespasian rule as forever. Quadratus, you conniving bastard. While you should have been inspiring more discipline in your troops, you were scheming in your oriental fashion to cover your faults with a perfumed gift. Very well, Quadratus. You have indeed pleased me, though I refuse to become so lost in this strange creature as to forget your shortcomings. Yes, your gift was to the mark, for I have been yearning for some trifling of softness in this present environment. We are surrounded by rocks, each harder than the other, and the people we oppose are harder than the rocks, and that greatest rock of all, Masada, appears more formidable every day. Hence, as you hope, Quadratus, I am disposed to smile upon your name, whether it falls from the lips of others or merely passes through my mind. And I do salute your acute perception, for you have chosen to my taste exactly where you choice any other I must certainly have refused. But I am not at all certain I can ever excuse your propagandizing this girl and her family with tales of the fabled Bernice and what she has done for herself let alone that extraordinary Jewish has done to Titus and, so the gossip goes, to Vespasian himself. Oh, you have planned with the utmost cunning, my fine Quadratus, for if such a communication were the result, 
if indeed this creature could drain my wits as well as my testicles and and make of me another Titus granting her every whim in favor then where would you be my good fellow directly under the sun as her original sponsor it would be quite natural for you to become her confidant and as her confidant become my secret sovereign nicely positioned to maneuver all manner of affairs to suit yourself and so in time there would be a new procurator for Judea oddly enough an Egyptian by birth and talents one who calls himself Quadratus in the Roman fashion as a dividend you would have early revenge for whatever humiliation my presence in Jericho may have brought you for you would have the exquisite pleasure of observing me trap in that most ancient of snares that uninevitable bypass in which a man wonders if his woman serves him for himself or because of what he can do for her.